Hello, I am Stian Sonarius. First of all, annual reminder about the FAIR principles. I'm sure you've heard this hundreds of times already, but just please remember they are actual principles, it's not just those four letters. The point is to, sh to share things so they are findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Metadata must be machine readable. And recently, this has come to attention to not just for data but also software and in particular computational workflows that is using that software to produce data they should also be fair and this brings me up to talk about research object which kind of predates fair uh, we can, i'm not going to take credit for saying we we invented it earlier but we kind of following along the same principles you cannot just publish a pdf you cannot just attach some csv file even if you're adding in some scripts and the individual figures and some logs and so on, you also need the metadata to describe what all those things are. So you don't just get a bunch of things, but they need to be typed and described and related to each other. And that itself should be also in a machine readable uh, language so that you can process this. And for instance, if you're just looking for workflows, you can just pick that up and ignore all the other things. Uh, we're now uh, using something called Arrow Crate, and uh, that is how you write down the research object. So you have uh, basically a JSON file. I'm sure you're all aware of what is JSON. Uh, the way we do it is basically a flat list of the things that are in the crate. Things that are considered to be in the research object are just listed uh, as individual entities, but basically these blocks. And you may recognize some of the uh, syntax and uh, and properties in here if you ever use schema.org, because basically that's what it is. It's just schema.org. But of course, you will usually have some data in there, some kind of files or directories or online databases or something. Anyway, you will also need a set of contextual entities, things to describe these, see how they fit in the world, how do they come to be. It could just be people, organizations, that kind of attribution could be funding, licensing, but it could also be things that are related to your research where things uh, happen, like a place, if you took a photo, it happened in the place, uh, provenance of how things came to be. Maybe you used a particular instrument to read uh, something, a liminal machine, for instance, could be listed in there. And of course, what is important for us today is also workflows, things that process the data should also be in the uh, our crate. Now this is a kind of pick and mix. So you use the ones that you need, the ones you feel appropriate. So our crate is kind of quite general, but today we're talking mainly about workflow our crates. Our crates to deal with workflows. And I'll show you a bit other kind of research objects as well. Now most people don't really want to sit and read our specifications and they just want to get going with this and easiest is to just use a desktop application like Describer, which allows you to just make these kind of entities uh, based on a folder of files. Say you just want to describe these, just add them in, say what type they are, give them some better names and descriptions, and add in all these contextual entities. You see you have these buttons just for doing this here. So it's a very easy way to get started. Of course, if you have a massive one, it's not going to work, then you want to start doing something programmatically. And then we have all the different programming languages uh, have libraries for those and this is what you use for building applications like the workflow hub which i'll come back to uh, but first let's have a look at something that's not workflows right so so something we found important here in our crate is to also think about uh, these people who or, or these use cases where there is no particular way of doing metadata already but you know it exists and you want to structure it and you want to keep it. So for instance, in Paradisec, you want they were digitizing cultural records, doing uh, recordings, people speaking the native languages, people transcribing that and annotating. And later someone scanned these images of the annotations handwritten. So it's very complex attributions here and multiple files involved and so on. So if you have a look, see here, everyone's you see what I'm talking about. You can see digitization helps a lot compared to what you have to start with. And so an important principle in this project was that the metadata that you have formalized should also be fair. So you don't want to just make it be trapped in this lovely portal they have built. 
in in some SQL database or something. But no, the data should all uh, metadata should outlive the portal, and that's where our crate crate came in useful on top of that. And so you don't see the our crate unless you click the little button in the corner. So this kind of layering of these different standards, it's how we do the separation of concerns. So we, we don't want to be adding in everything to make one big complex thing because say for instance you have a bunch of files it would be good to know that you have all the files and you haven't messed about with them. Uh, you know git can handle this, bag it is an easy way to do that where you just have a checksum file to listing them. Hardly any metadata but it, it's not its job. Its job is just to make sure everything is there. We know CDRL can deal with how to execute things uh, and other workflow systems as well. And they know how to pull in the different software they need to run to a varying degree. Now, you see interesting thing with CDRL here is that it could actually take the role of many of this. And that's because CDRL is a bit different from most other workflow languages that they already have hooks for metadata in basically everywhere in the language where you can put in arbitrary annotations ban battering on about fair and so on it's not just for the machines the humans are important right so if you have all this structured metadata it would be nice if you just look at it to see if you got it right or if you've been given one can i just see what it is right so a very important thing of our crate is to be able to render this so we have a tool that can generate this kind of html page we can actually click on individual data items which you see listed on the hash part here and then you can see, for instance, the orders of this next flow workflow listed here. So they get attribution for the things they have helped make. And this shows also how you could have different licenses, for instance, one license for the package and another for an individual item. That's the kind of thing that our crate is strong for because you have all the different entities which you can fill in metadata for. Now let's go to the workflow hub, uh, which you may or may not have heard of. Uh, it tends to be a registry for computational workflows in life sciences uh, we built it to be agnostic to workflow languages although you will see some workflow languages more than others and that has to do with how we started basically we put it live a bit too early so we, we are now in beta release but when we launched this in April it was kind of not quite ready but we just did it anyway just to get going and of course COVID-19 had a large part to do with that because we sort of have many different COVID-19 workflows being put together and uh, was very nice, but they're not really gathered anywhere. And so we started building this collection. And that's happened largely during the COVID-19 uh, biohackathon in the beginning of the year. And that really helped us actually the, as a project for Workflow Hub because we kind of iron out lots of things about what is this, what is the kind of minimal viable product we need to get going here. And uh, you may recognize some pictures <laughs> uh, of, of some of the people in here, but they're, they're actually quite a large span of workflows that are actually written by people who may not even know their workflow is on Workflow Hub because we did a kind of collaborative effort to annotate and register workflows. Now let's get back to the Workflow Hub and here's how it looks like if you register one of those workflows I just showed you from Bioxcel in the Workflow Hub. So you see we picked up things like the labels from the CDRL file so we can see what is going on obviously we do use the well viewer to render uh, the diagram and we pick up some of the metadata some of these things on the side here you fill in manually in the box when you register in the web interface uh, but other things we pick up from the CDRL file so obviously descriptions of the steps the outputs and so on but now we also have the download so you can download an hour crate and you get this kind of json back in here so it's not trapped in workflow hub the data you have filled in and so on will survive uh, also to other places and I'll come back to how this can be useful uh, but in workflow hub we're actually not just workflow so if you already used our CDRL view you know it's just a flat list of every workflow that has ever existed we're trying to be a bit more organized now so we're kind of kind of grouping for workflow particularly about where do they come from and what are they for so you can make these large organizations or you can just make individual small teams like here's a galaxy climate a, some kind of small in informal grouping of uh, workflows that have been uh, created in the workflow hub but we're using uh, the workflow hub is based on something called fairdom seek uh, which our group in manchester have been working on uh, for a long time together with uh, 
different groups in uh, Germany and has lots of other features which haven't really started using a lot in Workflow Hub, but things like you can add publications, data files, organizations, these kind of things in the world, like I mentioned, for our work, right? And we're, we're hoping to help bring this into the workflow world as well so that we can put workflows in context, right? Because so it's not just do analysis, no, it's linked into a particular kind of research. But yeah, you can just start and register the workflow as it is. Just upload the file and we keep the files for you. That's the simplest way to get started on the workflow, uh, on the workflow hub. And then we make the workflow hour create for you. It will be quite minimal to start with. It will be the things we can figure out from the workflow, things you have filled in. Ideally, we want uh, to harvest these things from a GitHub repository. So you can do this today by just giving a reference to GitHub, so then you don't need to upload any file. Ideally, we want our create metadata to be living in there, the GitHub repository, because then you can maintain that separately. So this way of describing your workflow is kind of how we can enable developers to, to automate part of this process so that you don't have to sit and click in forms to register every little workflow. So ideally, we want existing workflow repositories uh, like the common workflow library to just complete in and automatically get registered. So here's uh, an example of a Galaxy workflow, quite a small one, but you maybe you've seen the classical .ga Galaxy JSON file coming out, which is can be a bit cryptic, right? Basically, you have to be Galaxy to understand it. And now Galaxy have developed a new format in YAML that you may at first look, hey, hang on, isn't that CVL? No, not quite but it's very much similar. But given that, it was quite easy to just convert that to CDWell. And that's what we did in this tool called Galaxy to, to, to CDWell. And particularly with CDWell 1.2, we can leave the individual nodes of the steps just as a class operation, which means they don't actually run in CDWell. And so that's what we call abstract CDWell. So it's a workflow in CDWell that you can't run, not yet at least. Uh, because you would need to understand all these tool shed things to know how to run a Galaxy tool. But it's still very useful for us for the descriptions because we just want the kind of boxes and arrow version of the workflow. So we have the connections and the individual steps and ideally one day even the descriptions of what each of them are doing. Now, our create comes on useful when we want to exchange these kind of workflows because the workflows are not just a single file. Now we have you know, a Galaxy file with a sidecar file of a CDRL, maybe some test data on the side, called Life Monitor, which takes this and tries to run the workflow, puts it into a continuous integration system like Jenkins. So next now for our Create and Workflow Hub, we have worked well together and also brought along various EOSC activities and a uh, common workflow language, but we need more now we need to mature more, right? So we need more tutorials, uh, particularly for our crate, because we have matured the specification, the libraries and so on. So developers who really go into the gritty details, the things are there, but people who don't know about it, they should not have to come and listen to this talk. They, they should have a, what do I do with this R crate someone gave me, right? Which we would just tell them to load it up and describe or maybe look at the preview file and so on, explain what is it all about. Workflow Hub, we need to do a similar kind of integration like we did with Galaxy, try it again with Nextflow and SnakeMake, and already we have uh, developers from these uh, communities which are just helping out, and that largely because of this uh, 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 IO hackathons that they have become engaged. So we want to engage also with other communities, particularly the outside workflows. So in EOS, there are several things happening. Uh, we heard we all heard about the portable executionable package before, and so we have already been talking uh, with Nathan about that. And GF4GH have lots of things going on, particularly on the execution side. Uh, workflows, obviously we want more workflows. Please register your CDWell workflows today. Does not matter which state you're in. Uh, we can have, uh, you can indicate the state it is in. And if you reference it by Git, then you can pick up the updates. And now we're changing what we hope to do Git-based storage. Uh, struggling a bit to get it to work without just re-implementing all of GitHub. 
Uh, but if we get this as a kind of storage layer, that means it's easier for us to just pick up updates happening for workflows that are maintained in Git. And now we talked about these test and execution systems. Now, we we're not building this in the workflow hub. We're not adding a run interface to it. The workflow hub is just for finding workflows to understand them, not to d do your daily work of running them. But we can send you off to these things when we recognize that it's a supported workflow system. Uh, for instance, uh, Galaxy have different uh, public instances we can use. But they have to go along with the testing. So we know, for instance, the tools can be installed there. And for our create, we really need to build now up the kind of marketing material. So you can come along and see what is it for, what is it for, what does it do, why should I care, right? So we need to ex we need to explain a bit better at a high level, pretty much without any JSON, but more like why uh, would you want our create? What can you do for me? And that concludes uh, my talk. And uh, thank you. So you can join us. And I really hope that some of you do. Because we are very uh, active and very positive communities. Our crate have, uh, we had monthly calls. We're now moving to bi-weekly calls. Because not everybody could handle their uh, Australian sync uh, late at night. So now we have all that in a morning call. This Thursday, actually. And... Uh, workflow hub we also have bi-weekly calls and it's it's just to join you can also just hang along in our slack chat and and ask questions there